and warm welcome. Uh, this is Clement Steinberg. I welcome you to the Quality 101 Institute. So today's topic is clinical quality management, and I welcome all of you who joined for this session. We have hopefully a very interesting session for you, and we want to make it as hands-on as possible. So I want to welcome my co-presenters. Um, how about if we quickly go around and do a round of introduction? I will start uh, with Chep Maritim. Chep, can I turn it over to you for a quick introduction? Yes, thank you, Clements. This is Chep Maritim. I am a NAS consultant with the Clinical and Quality Branch, the Division of Policy and Data in the HIV AIDS Bureau, also known as HAB. Thank you, Clements. Kevin, do you want to go next? Sure, thanks. Hi, I'm Kevin Garrett, and I'm the Senior Manager of the Center for Quality Improvement and Innovation. And uh, I am Clement Steinberg. I'm the Director for CQII, the Center for Quality Improvement and Innovation. And uh, we have been recently refunded, and um, we're looking forward for this very interesting um, session for you. Um, I wanted to quickly take the first five minutes or so um, to do a introduction what's in stake for our um, workshop. So first we're gonna learn a little bit about PCN, that's Policy Clarification Notice 1502. It sets the stage a little bit what HRSA, the HIV AIDS Bureau, expects from all of you regarding the Clinical Quality Management Program. And then we wanna go through some key principles and how they apply and in HIV care. We also want to give you a, a very broad introduction to the PDSA cycle, the Plan, Do, Study, Act, and how you can start to think about how to apply that into a QI project. And lastly, um, in the remaining minutes of our 60-minute session, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the quality improvement resources and services that CQII um, have available for all of you, regardless of your funding source. So here's the agenda. Uh, it repeats a little bit what the learning objectives are. I want to start out with a very quick example, um, a very hands-on example of a program um, that has used quality improvement in their own ways. And I want to show that because we wanted to really make it as concrete as possible. Um, Chap will talk a little bit of PCN 1502. I will come back for the QI principles before Kevin will talk about the QI project in PDSA cycle. And then we talk about the offerings and resources. So I want to start out uh, with a, a very quick example to make this really hands-on. At the end of the day, we are preaching quality improvement not for the purpose just meeting an expectation, but more so to improve HIV care. And so I want to start out with an example that hopefully makes sense to you, something that you may be able to relate to. Um, so here we have a program. Um, it is a fictitious program, but their uh, caseload um, is uh, overall is uh, 89%. So that's the overall caseload, something that's probably mirrors very much what the average uh, Ryan White program has, which 87%. But this program a clinic um, identified housing as a key issue. And when it is, when it ran the numbers regarding those that face housing insecurities, their viral load suppression rate was 77%. So they used that challenge as an opportunity and tried to apply quality improvement principle. So the first step they did is to better understand what are the root causes, right? And so they did some patient focus groups. So they asked the patients, they used some of the um, caps that they had and really in investigated a little bit more with some case managers a little bit of chart review, and they basically turned out that they really had those individuals with housing insecurities had a very high show rate, no show rate. So basically they did not show up to the appointment at a higher rate than the overall um, patients being served by the same clinic. Also there were changes in contact information and also there were identified transportation issues as barriers to ongoing HIV care and meeting the viral load suppression rates. So here, any good project starts with an aim statement. So what they did try to do is to really articulate in the shortest way possible about how they can articulate their goal. And so here, I'm gonna read it out very quickly, is the virus suppression goal was identified as increased the virus suppression rate for HIV clients who were identified in the medical record as not or unstably housed, which also includes homelessness, from currently 77 to 89% by December, 2020. They also want to address screening rate 
because they had a very low screening rate for housing for all patients. I think the key issue here is to really articulate um, in simplistic terms where you want to go. Um, that addresses when others want to learn more about your project and always refer back to the aim statement. So this project also did a driver diagram, which is probably a very advanced uh, quality improvement tool. But I think I wanted to bring in to say that even a complex issue needs to be broken down and to really think about what are the steps, and this is the primary drivers that that can influence, and then really develop secondary drivers and then develop interventions related to it. We know that even complex issues such as housing can be addressed through quality improvement. So here are a couple of ideas that they implemented. So we heard from uh, transportation. And so that what they developed was they um, had a new contract with a taxi service um, to really assist the uh, patients to come in. Also the staff were trained on motivational interviewing to really engage patients. And they also um, assigned a peer navigator to those patients that were identified in the medical record with housing insecurities and really tried to address and help them and ask them what we can do to help you to keep the appointment and take your medications routinely. And lastly, um, given the, the lifestyle, I think they also increased in this example, the walking opportunities. So there were uh, walking appointments to be able to allow those patients when they're ready to come to an appointment, the clinic is ready for those patients to come in. And the last slide I have uh, here for you is the, is the outcome. You not only see that the viral suppression rate over time went up, but I think more importantly is also that the gap between the overall patients being seen, meaning all patients seen by the same clinic, versus those patients with housing insecurities, that that gap <clears throat> that was initially 16% came down to, um, in this case, 5%, clearly room for improvement, but um, still. So what are the essential lessons learned here using quality improvement? A, you want to use data. You want to be sure that a change and an in improvement are two different things. And you want to realize that in order to differentiate a change and improvement, you need data. Data also helps you to set the goal. Where's my horizon? Where's my um, goal where I want to end up? I think that's also <clears throat> important to set your aims. And the aim statement was a reminder to really put this in place. Certainly it's a work in progress. You can change it, but it's important to do so. And lastly, I think this is um, well understood in quality improvement that you need a team approach. That quality improvement is not only done by an individual uh, quality improvement champion, but even the champion needs others in the clinic. So with that, I wanted to give you a successful story just to think about the application for quality improvement with an example in housing. So and if I switch over to the next slide. So Chap, uh, do you wanna talk a little bit more about BCN 1502, and yes. I think you have about 10 minutes, so I will try to keep track here. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Clements. I will be discussing PCN 1502, expectations for the clinical quality management. Next slide. The Health Resources and Service Administration supports more than 90 programs that provide health care to people who are geographically isolated, economically or medically vulnerable, through grants and cooperative agreements to more than 3,000 awardees, including community and faith-based organizations, colleges and universities, hospitals, states, local and tribal governments, and private entities. Every year, HASA program serves tens of millions of people, including people with HIV, pregnant women, mothers and their families, and those otherwise unable to access quality of care. Quality care. Next slide. HARSA's HIV AIDS Bureau, also known as HAB's vision, is to provide optimal HIV care and treatment for all. Our mission is to provide leadership and resources to assure access to and retention in high quality, integrated care and treatment services for vulnerable people with HIV and AIDS and their families. Next slide. HARSA's Ryan White HIV AIDS program provides comprehensive system of HIV primary care, medication and essential service support for low income people with HIV. More than half of the people diagnosed with HIV in the United States, nearly half a million people receive care through the Ryan HIV AIDS program. 
funds grants to states, cities, and counties, and local communities and organizations. Recipients determine service delivery and funding priorities based on local needs and planning process. Hustis Ryan White HIV AIDS program is a pay of last resort statutory provision. Funds may not be used for services if other states or federal payer is available. 81.7% of, of all of Ryan White HIV AIDS program clients were virally suppressed in 2018, exceeding the national average of 62.7. Next slide. So this was just the objectives that we had uh, discussed earlier, and we're gonna review them in the upcoming slides. Next slide. Ryan White HIV AIDS Program Treatment Modernization Act of 2016, Title 26. All Ryan White HIV AIDS programs recipients are required to establish clinical quality management programs to one, assess the extent to which HIV health services are consistent with the most recent public health service guidelines for the treatment of HIV disease and related opportunistic infections. Two, develop strategies to ensure that such services are consistent with the guidelines for improvement in the access to and the quality of HIV services. Next slide. So the clinical quality management, also known as CQM, policy clarification notice 1502, also known as PCN 1502. The purpose, this policy clarification is to clarify the health resources and services administration expectation for all quality management programs. Originally released in September of 2015 and, re -revi and revised and re-released in November 2018, the scope of coverage, it covers all Ryan White HIV AIDS programs, but A, B, C, and D, recipients and sub-recipients. Please see the link below to read the whole document. In order to develop a CQM program, that provides patient care health outcomes and patient satisfaction, certain components are necessary. These necessary components are infrastructure, performance measures, and quality improvement. Infrastructure details who supports the program and how. Elements are needed to organize, develop, implement, and evaluate CQM program activities. Infrastructure includes leadership, CQM committee, dedicated staff, dedicated resources, a quality management plan, involvement of people with HIV, stakeholder involvement, evaluation of your CQM program. Next is performance measures. Performance measures is a process of collecting, analyzing, and reporting data regarding patient care health outcomes on an individual or population level and patient satisfaction. CQM program's objective is to drive change or improvement. Without measurement data, the effectiveness of implement, implemented improvement efforts and subsequent health outcomes cannot adequately, accurately, or appropriately be assessed. The question is how many measures are required? Recipients should identify at least two performance measures for the Ryan White HIV AIDS program service category where greater than or equal to 50% of the recipient's eligible clients receive at least one unit of service. Recipients should identify at least one performance measure for Ryan White HIV AIDS program service category where greater than 15% or less than 50% of the recipient's eligible clients receive at least one unit of service. Recipients, sh recipients do not need to identify performance measures for Ryan White HIV AIDS program service category where less than or equal to 15% of the client's eligible service receive at least one unit of service. Next slide. So, once the uh, how often should you collect the data? The frequency, collect regular collection and analyzing of data, minimum quarterly. Collect and analyze data so that you're able to review and discuss with committee members and stakeholders to determine quality improvement projects and to assess the health disparities. Once the data has been co collected and analyzed, it is ready to determine where or who or what in the program requires change. Next, we will discuss quality improvement. So what is QI? QI entails the development of development and implementation of activities to make change to the program in response to the performance data results. Recipients are required to implement a quality improvement activity aimed at improving patient care, health outcomes, and patient satisfactions. 
recipients are expected to implement quality improvement activities using a defined approach or methodology and document these activities. Recipients should conduct quality improvement activity at least for one funded service category at any given time. Activities may span multiple categories. Next slide. PCN 1502 discusses the role of the recipient in relation to the sub-recipients. So what is the recipient role? The recipients are to identify the specific CQM program activities for their service areas or network. CQM activities include performance measures portfolios, frequency of performance measure data collection, and identification of quality improvement activities, among other items. Recipients need to ensure that their sub-recipients that provide services have the cap capacity to contribute to the recipient CQM program, resources to conduct CQM activities in the organization, implement a CQM program in the organization. Recipients are expected to provide guidance to the sub-recipients on prioritizing measures and, data and collecting data. Recipients should work with sub-recipients to identify improvement opportunities and monitor quality improvement activities at the sub-recipient location. Prioritization of CQM activities can, should be coordinated across Ryan White HIV AIDS program recipients within service area and sub-recipients funded through the recipient. Next slide. Often associated with clinical quality management is quality assurance. Quality assurance refers to the broad spectrum of activities aimed at insurance compliance with the minimum quality standards. Quality assurance is a component of the recipient's larger administrative function. The quality assurance activity should be used by the clinical quality management program. Please note that quality assurance may inform the clinical quality management program, but it does not improve health outcomes. Next slide. So I want to invite you to, um, all, uh, to listen in on all our CQM sessions. Please refer to this slide and the various dates and times that will cover um, all the CQM requirements for CQM plan. Next slide. This is a website for requesting technical assistance. If you need any technical assistance regarding your CQM program, please go to the Target HIV site and it will direct you to the to the site where you can put in a TA, please ask any question and we can always address it regarding your CQM program. Next slide. Thank you very much. And again, I'm Chef Mariti, a NAS consultant with HAB. Please feel free to email or contact me and I will be glad to respond to any of your questions. Thank you. Thank and you, Chef. I very much appreciate it also to set the stage and to give us a little bit the overall expectation. Very much appreciate it. And I know you have been incredibly accessible to provide assistance and help um, how to further interpret and understand the PCN 1502. So thank you so much for your leadership on that. Next item on the agenda is to take a step back a little bit and think about what are the some of the core principles in quality improvement. So um, the first one I have for you, and this is really a reflection over the last decade or so of doing quality improvement in HIV care. And I think the first one is that it's, it's how do we define success? And I think it's really important to realize that success is achieved through meeting, through meeting the needs of those we serve. Um, in other words, that you have to really think very carefully and listen very carefully about how, how, what, what are your clients tell you, how you do that, and how, what, what's the implementation of your quality improvement efforts. And I give you one example. When I worked in a, in a, in a clinic, we, we had wonderful instructions how to get to the clinic, but the instruction was only to the front door and it was a multi-campus academic center in an urban center. And so if I'm newly diagnosed and I don't wanna be um, associated with an HIV program, I may have turned around. So think a little bit about how success and really listen very carefully. Um, your needs and how your perception of those needs versus asking one that you may come to a different conclusions. The next one is most problems are found in processes, not in people. It's the realization that often we think that, well, if we just work a little bit harder and if the one person just doing their job, we will all doing and resolving many of the issues around us. And it's always has been a debate in quality improvement, how many um, issues that we are facing are really 
systemic I mean, in terms of there are driven by processes versus individuals. And Deming always talks about that over 98% in his estimation were process related. So really, if you think about that, we only want to be shy away from making personal, you know, if there's one person would work well, the whole process, the whole flow chart would work well. Most likely in most scenarios, it's we have to change the underlying process of how care is delivered, how we approach, how we link clients that needs to be changed in order to really find the success. The next one is do not reinvent the wheel, learn from best practices. If you are a quality manager out in the program and don't reinvent the wheel, I think we have, you have a lot more quality improvement champions around the country. Um, there are a lot of intervention that have been well documented. Think about the hundreds of intervention, evidence informed intervention that are available to you. And something that's really important to recognize, make, call up your colleague across the street, across the state, across the country, and ask them how they do and address, for instance, uh, how they reduce disparities. And I think you can learn a lot from what's already out there. So if you're struggling and you don't know what your ideas are, reach out to your colleagues. Um, you can certainly reach out to CKII. We have plenty of interventions that have been proven and we have some evidence for its success to get you going on your quality improvement journey. This is a really important part because often when we address very complex issues, we want to um, address stigma, we want to address um, housing, we want to address substance use mental health, that we always believe if the, if the issue is very complex, we have to often find very complex solutions. But one thing that I learned and was echoed in, in quality improvement is that change is more likely to come through small incremental changes but in one big change. So if you think about, um, we had housing before, think about one change that you can do and learn from that and build upon that. And I want to make the link later for PDSA cycle because I think there clearly builds upon that idea of small incremental changes. Um, I had the pleasure of working in different settings, but one idea about small incremental changes still resonates with me today is to say, think big, start small, and grow. The next principle I think worth pointing out today is that your improvement actions should be based upon accurate and measured data. There's a difference between what you think your clients will tell you or what, what you think the perceptions are among your staff, what you want to do next, versus actual measurement of data. So we want to really be sure that you have the necessary data available, particularly when you start a project. There may be myriads of options to improve, but at the end of the day, you probably can tackle maybe one project at the time. So the question is, what's the one project you want to start? And for identifying that, you really need to basically go back, use data, go back to your medical record. Hopefully you have an electronic medical record system to facilitate that process and look at the data and then take action accordingly. Last point here, data are not only your medical record, data could also be by making interviews of your um, patients. It could be people with HIV reaching out to community and see what they are perceiving as barriers to care, why they're not coming back at the same rate as others. This is a hard lesson to learn that often um, we need to be sure that our yin yang between efforts regarding quality improvement is in balance with those of measurement. Too often we go to programs and you say, tell us what you have done over the last year, and they show you reports of data, um, wonderfully done, a lot of efforts went in, but when you ask the question, so what have you done with the data, then obviously often at times there is a little bit of a um, silence on the other end. So find a balance between uh, measurement and improvement. In order most likely to make room for quality improvement, since quality improvement is not an add-on to your busy agenda already in your daily schedule, is you may want to consider a little bit like how often you want to measure because in order to find time to do the important quality improvement work. 
we also know that a um, the infrastructure needs to be in place. And when we use the word infrastructure, we mean a sound clinical quality management program um, that has the leadership support, that has the committee in place, that has a written quality uh, management plan in place. Here's my last slide before I turn it over to Kevin. Um, here you see a sign. I will give you a few seconds here to see. So what's the most important message on this slide? It's probably the one, the last word here that says also the bridge is out ahead. And I think it's a reminder that there are a lot of things you can improve. There are a lot of things you can measure, but always take a step back and think about what's the most important one? What's the most relevant to my community, to the staff that we serve and the clinic, that, or the, the clients that we serve and the staff we have, what's important to all of them? And then you have to make your choices. In fact, it's often recommended to really tackle one project at a time to rather than taking on too many. Again, if you have more questions, we're gonna give our contact information at the very end of this session. We're happy to uh, dive further into those areas mentioned so far. So, Kevin, can I turn it over to you? Yes, thanks, Colin. So, you can go to the next slide. Um, basically, Chep talked a few minutes ago about structured methodology being important in the context of PCM 1502. Well, it's just, really important in quality improvement in general. Um, you don't want to take wild stabs at doing things and then move on to something else if that doesn't work. What really kind of sets that up for you is your data, right? Um, you have data, you need to know how to kind of slice and dice it. You need to know what, what it's telling you because your data is going to talk to you if, if you know how to listen to it. Um, it's going to help you be proactive but it also helps you define where you're going. If you look at something like viral suppression, um, you can see in very concrete numbers if you're doing well in viral suppression or if you're not. By further analysis, you can break it down and see where you may not be doing. Maybe it's with males 50 and over, or maybe it's with adolescents, right? So we made reference on the slide to the seven uh, tools of quality. Um, ASQ has a really good um, set of pages on the seven tools of quality. There are seven tools, which I won't get into now, but if you Google it, you'll see that these tools are kind of varied and they'll help you look through your data, analyze it, and identify problem areas. Next slide. So in healthcare, we use the model for improvement a lot. Um, it was developed by Associates of Process Improvement and it's the beauty of it is in its simplicity, right? Um, improvement is always all about learning. Um, in the model for improvement in PDSA cycles, it's, it's trial and error, right? And you learn as much from your errors as you do from your successes. Um, you're measuring your progress through different means, and there's a number of data collection instruments you can use. You just have to make sure that your data collection plan mirrors what it is that you want to achieve. Um, and then finally, you're going to test ideas using PDSA cycles, plan, do, study, act cycles. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Next slide. So in a nutshell, this is the model for improvement. And I drew it this way because I want to show that it's kind of elegant simplicity really fits in very well, not only in healthcare, um, but in, in many different areas where it's used. So it asks three questions of you. What are you trying to accomplish? How will you know your changes and improvement? And what change can we make that will result in an improvement? Next slide. So what are we trying to accomplish? This is really where you've already analyzed your data. Now you know that you have something going on and you want to address it. So you develop an aim statement, right? The aim statement has specific target in the time frame. If you remember the one that Clemens put up a while ago in the sample QI project, it had very specific targets and a time frame by which those targets were going to be met. Um, again, data is very critical to this. Um, and I always advise people to also build a hypothesis around this. Very simply, if you do this, then something should happen. And the importance of that comes through in step number two. Next slide, please. When you actually, oh, sorry about that. Uh, building a name statement. 
Somebody asked me once, how do I build an aim statement? It seems very complex, and it's really not. I, there's a template that's developed here, and you can just kind of plug things in. Your organization name seeks to do increase or decrease what um, over when. And if you look at the example, you can see that it's a pretty fairly comprehensive aim statement. Another thing you can do is just build a table um, and answer those questions, and you've then pretty much developed your aim statement. You just have to put it into a sentence. Next slide, please. So if you look at this, the clinic has a significant no-show rate, approximately three out of every 10 scheduled appointments are missed. There's a few things we know. Retention is critical. Better retention will lead to increased viral suppression rate. Um, and I want to include the no-show rate so that only one out of every 10 appointments is missed. Next slide. So we're kind of building this, right, within the context of model for improvement, and it's structured, which is really important when somebody else needs to pick up your work and see what you're doing. If you look at the example of the AIM statement, our clinic wants to lower the no-show rate from 30% down to 10% in the next six months to ultimately increase viral suppression rate. So basically what we're saying is if we do something, if we lower the no-show rate, then something's going to happen and that is the viral suppression rates should increase. Next slide. Now, the way we would know that is we would have some ideas of measures that we're gonna use in this to kind of keep us on track. Um, you're going to dig into your data a little bit more once you start collecting it. Um, knowledge of the past is also very helpful in deciding what you wanna do. When I worked in the VA system, one of the things that they talked about was the clinical lore of, you know, we think this happens based upon what we've observed. You don't have data, but over time you build a certain knowledge base. Um, and many times it's, it's correct, but your data helps you define what that is and look and see if it's really lore or if it's really fact. Um, some of the tools are mentioned there. Flow charts, obvious for process. The Shikawa diagrams are very, very helpful um, in understanding, addressing a problem. Um, column and bar charts are very good to basically break down your uh, patient demographics sometimes or to look at different things occurring in your organization. And it does help you do a deeper dive. Next slide, please. So this really is kind of the meat of the model for improvement. This is where you get to the point where you're developing ideas for change. You have your data, you've, you've seen some things that need to be changed, you have a working hypothesis and a name statement, you've developed some kind of measures um, in the how will you know piece that will basically tell you you're on the right track or you're not on the right track. So now what you're going to do basically is conduct an exercise, usually a brainstorming people use, to help you generate ideas for change, right? Um, but not every idea is feasible. So that's where something called the priority matrix comes in. And we have um, webinars on things like the priority matrix and conducting brainstorms um, on the target center. The priority matrix is important because it gives you an idea of what only will have maximum impact and how difficult it will be to implement. Um, you can also use a force field to assess the chances for success. Um, that's another very interesting thing. It's simple to do. It looks at all the ideas that are going to impact on the change and all the ideas that will contribute to making the change successful. Um, which brings you to the next step, which is testing. Thank you. And that is the PDSA cycles. Next slide. So when we go into the PDSA cycles, the first step is planning, right? Um, what you're going to do now that you have everything prioritized and you know exactly what it is that you want to act on, um, you have to figure out who's going to be involved, when it's going to happen, where it's going to happen. Um, how do you start? Do you start with one person? Do you start with three persons? Do you start with one person for half a day or do you start with three persons for an hour? 
Um, that really is where teams come in and kind of the, the group think process works very, very well in thinking through this. <clears throat> Again, our hypothesis is if we lower the no-show rate, then the viral suppression will increase. Um, so determine your first test population. Definitely start small because the last thing you want to do is roll something out to half a clinic or half a EMA and then see that, oops, we didn't think through this and this happened and everything comes grinding to a halt. That's why this is so important and that's why you really want to start small. Um, you need to start thinking in the plan cycle about step measures, sometimes called intermediate measures. Whatever they're called, they're really going to be very important when you go into the do cycle because that's what you're going to collect data on to see if this is actually working. And that's what you're going to look at when you go into the next cycle after the do cycle for analyzing what happened. Um, oh, and one thing, again, I'll, I'll say this probably a couple of times more, but you need to document. Documentation is not only going to let you know what happened and keep a historical record, but it's also a teaching aid and it's an audit trail. If someone leaves, someone retires, they need to be able to see what you did last year. They need to see how you structured it. They need to see what went well and also what went different, and what didn't go so well. Next. So you carry out the plan. You start collecting data. You want to see if the data kind of reflects the hypothesis. You can use something as simple as a check sheet. You can use something like Excel if you want to be a little more fancy. But again, you document each test, right? And it's a roadmap for your future tests. You want to make note of anything unexpected that happens. And then when you move to the next cycle, next slide, which is study, where you're going to look at your data that you've collected. You may want to do some analysis with it. You may have just a couple of different data points. And you're going to look at those and say, oh, this is totally different than what we thought in hypothesis. So maybe we need to rethink this. We're going to reflect on what we learned. Next slide. And go to act. This is where you're going to think about what your next test should be like. You're going to analyze the data. You're going to, again, work as a group. You're going to make decision, decisions such as expanding the scope of the text, test for the next cycle. Um, do you need to modify the innovation, intervention? Um, after a few tests, you're going to decide if you should abandon this if it doesn't seem to support the hypothesis. Uh, you may want to rethink your aim statement. Um, you may want to do a number of things, but this is where you do this, okay? And it's important to kind of note that you don't skip these steps. Over the years, I've spoken to people that have said, oh, yeah, we, we tried a PDSA cycle, but it didn't work. The first question is, well, what did your model for improvement do? And, well, we didn't use that. Um, you should, because the PDSA cycle is really a way of kind of testing what you came up with in the model for improvement. So the two work very synergistically. Um, again, teamwork. All the people involved in this project need to look at what the data is, contribute ideas, and then move on to the next test. And you keep doing this in an iterative cycle until you're satisfied that your change is going to work. So let's say that you want to change an intake form. Um, you're not just going to change the form, give it to whoever the intake worker is and say, here, use this for everybody that comes in from now on. That's a potential disaster, right? Um, so you would test it. You would test it on maybe three people for half a day that walk in the door. Um, look at your data. Analyze the data. And then you plan for the next test. Maybe you want to use it for a whole day with one intake worker. Maybe you want to use two intake workers for half a day. It depends, right? And that's where the art of this comes in. It's, there's no hard and fast rule for this. But when you move through these cycles, they're going to tell you things provided that you've thought 
through what you want to collect in the first place and that you have an accurate aim statement and you've analyzed your data correctly. Next slide. So just to recap, um, it's really important that they're iterative um, and they're multiple tests of expanding scope like I, I just kind of talked through. Um, definitely start small. Don't ever like roll out a change and, and throw the organization's chaos because that usually is not a good thing for being a quality improvement organization with a quality improvement focus. Um, and don't give up after one try. Make tweaks. It's very important that you learn from your failures because they're also opportunities. Um, Edison once said that it took him 10,000 and one try to make a light bulb, but he had 10,000 learning opportunities on how to make the light bulb correctly. So it's a little different way of looking at things. Um, and it's a good way of looking at things. Um, and you'll know when to rethink your idea because it'll be perfectly obvious because your data will tell you that. Next slide. So, Clemens, you now you can talk about CQII offerings. Thank you, Kevin. Very much appreciated. So, what I want to do maybe for the next couple of minutes to give you an overview of resources that are available to you at no cost, something you can check out um, in the breaks of the conference or shortly thereafter um, that are accessible to all of you. First one, if you want to find a, all our resources, <clears throat> they are all posted at the Target HIV site. Um, the best way to access our um, online presence on Target HIV is to put in your uh, browser cqi.org. So cqii.org, it will directly redirect you to our web page. Um, we have plenty of our resources there. We routinely update our materials. You can find recent TA call recordings. Kevin mentioned several tools. Um, they're all there. Um, you can access them at any time. Some of the resources I will mention now will also post it here on our CQII website. First, I wanted to, Jeff mentioned already the availability of on and offsite technical assistance um, that based on your uh, needs, a, a online form needs to be completed and sent in um, for the HIV AIDS Bureau to review. And then um, the HRSA HIV Bureau will determine with you the TA objectives and uh, find the best way to help you. Um, one of the resources that CQII developed all the way back in 2007 are online tutorials. They're usually about 15 to 20 minutes long. They are in English and Spanish, and they really are across a different gambit of QI competencies for beginner to advance, not only for providers, but also for consumers. Um, it's probably the most recently, uh, most frequently accessed um, resource that we have out there. I would hope that you find the time to access one and many more. We're in the process of redoing many of them. Um, and also recently we um, also added um, a section on the Quality Academy specifically for uh, people with HIV in quality. That section is called quality, consumers in quality. Um, we also have technical assistance calls. They are um, 60 minutes long, a program that Kevin oversees. And we usually do about at least 10 to 12 a year. They are available at no cost. They're usually 60 to 90 minutes long. And they really try to balance between um, the expertise that some experts have, but also balance that against some best practices uh, by your peers. And it's hopefully um, a lot of helpful and rich discussion that occurs on those TA calls. And also worth pointing out that uh, the, the slides and the recordings are available at the Target HIV site that you can access by going to cqii.org. We also have advanced training programs. I wanna specifically highlight TOT, TQL, TCB, um, a training program that the three advanced training programs, obviously they were based in person, so obviously with the COVID pandemic around us, we probably have to rethink a little bit how we best structure them. But our trainer train 
program is a three-day fairly rigorous program that targets to really expand the pool of QI trainers. Uh, the quality uh, TQL, um, which is the training of quality leaders, really tries to engage quality leaders about their role in quality improvement and also for coaching. But those particular, those providers that have or work with a network of sites, so you actually have to teach and coach others around quality improvement. Look at our website at upcoming sessions, so if you want to join us. We believe very strongly that uh, people with HIV are an important uh, component of improvement. And so we developed uh, multiple training programs that um, we implemented. And I just wanted to, um, there are a lot of resources. I mentioned already our um, tutorials on the Quality Academy. But we are thinking about going forward, we will have multiple national webinars for consumers. And whenever we do an activity, we really want to be sure to really support um, cons um, people with HIV and their ability to be partners in regional and national quality improvement activities. We, for a long time, we really believed very strongly that we want to highlight the success stories. So look out for our announcements. We're always looking for the quality champions out there. Um, we have a national quality award program that usually launches in March. Um, so the next one will be then in March, 2021 and where we have established common categories and want to really hear from you. It's nomination based. We have an internal um, review committee that's, that's uh, in part by CQI, but also we have HAP, or HAP representation to really be sure that we can um, highlight the success stories and give you the award that you deserve. I want to focus on two upcoming activities. They are not currently available, but we are planning to do so. Um, one is our learning lab. Uh, I think COVID-19 has told us that we need to think very um, strategically about using virtual training and virtual capacity building. I think in response, we wanted to really build a learning lab, which is basically a, uh, we're thinking currently about three courses, potentially expanding it further. One on quality 101, advanced quality improvement, and consumers in QI. Something that we want to build. There are three months long, there are every other um, week for 90 minutes, so six sessions in total. It's really a very hands-on what you can learn to really apply quality improvement. And then we, um, this is just a heads up that we have um, want to do an upcoming collaborative uh, focusing on social determinants of health. There's more to come, uh, but we're really excited. We, we believe that, that quality improvement can tackle and improve even complex areas of improvement. So we look out for our announcements in the fall, and hopefully you can join us for that national improvement effort that is built upon our End Disparities Echo Collaborative, a successful collaborative that our last one ended in December of 2019. Here are just tons of resources available to you. Um, there are, again, you can go to our website, you can download on PDF, a few of them uh, may be still available in hot copy, so you can certainly send us an email. We have the contact information in a second. And we, if there are hard copies available, we're happy to send them out to you. Um, here's just a slide of the sessions that, um, and there will be more announcement by CQII. Send us an email if you want to add your, your name to our announcements. Um, there are a couple of sessions that will occur. Uh, we have multiple sessions, and so we hope that we can see it at the other sessions that CQII is offering. And also check out the many um, quality improvement sessions that the HRSA HIV AIDS Bureau puts out, uh, Jeff having one today, but there are many others from other members of her team. With that, um, I just wanted to highlight the contact information from myself, Clemens, and Kevin, who you heard earlier. At the end of the day, we are here to help you. Uh, we want to create a catalyst for your changes. And with that, we're going to conclude our session for today. I want to thank you for your um, participation for the day. I hope you have um, you check out other resources during the conference and hope we can see you um, and make a request. We are here to help you. With that, uh, we conclude our session and I wish you the very best. Thank you very much.